Good afternoon and welcome uh, to the swearing in of our two newest commissioners, Kenneth Adams and also Daryl Arbertine. Uh, these are our two men who exhibit the talent that Governor Cuomo has brought to this administration, and you can't think of two more important topics than economic development and agriculture in New York State. So uh, we are very, very proud. At the Senate uh, chamber yesterday during uh, the voting, it was just a wonderful display of support from the Senate in terms of th these two individuals. So I congratulate them both and their families, and we'll introduce in a few minutes. I'm proud to bring up uh, Senator Patty Ritchie. Senator? Thank you. I want to join in commending uh, Governor Cuomo on the two appointments. It's only fitting that these two nominees were confirmed by the Senate on the same day. Economic development and agriculture are two areas that can play an integral role in the success of each other. I'm very pleased that this administration recognizes the connection, which not only will have a direct benefit on my district, but on the residents of New York State and all. Agriculture is the state's number one industry, generating $5 billion in annually for farmers across the state. But our farmers face challenges. In recognizing the role economic development can play in the agriculture industry will go a long way towards the state for moving forward and in the right direction. Once again, I want to applaud the governor for his foresight in picking the two nominees. Congratulations, Daryl. Congratulations, Ken. I look forward to working with both of you. Thank you. I'm um, honored to bring up Senator Jim Malisi. Senator. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I'll make sure I don't call you mayor anymore. We'll have to get out of that habit. Good morning, everybody. No, good afternoon. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, to welcome these superb choices that the governor has made once again, showing the vision uh, of his leadership in selecting Ken Adams and Darrell Aubertine uh, to his administration. And in the remarks that I made yesterday, we acknowledged the importance of agriculture as being the number one business in New York State and the importance of having uh, someone with his experience, uh, not only in government, but also his uh, life experience in agriculture. And with Ken Adams, of course, his long list of experience in advocating for business and uh, most recently with the Business Council, the governor couldn't have made any better choices in those two areas or in the other areas that he has made so far. So I'm very delighted to uh, uh, welcome them and acknowledge them and thank the governor. Thank the governor for uh, his leadership in delivering a budget as well as a superb administration. Uh, it's my honor now to introduce the, the person uh, who has brought strength back to government, who has brought vision to the process, and who has given hope back to the people. Ladies and gentlemen, Governor Cuomo. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. First, to Lieutenant Governor Bob Duffy, who is doing a great job. He did a great job as mayor. He's doing a great job as Lieutenant Governor. Let's give him a round of applause, Lieutenant Governor Bob Duffy. <laughs> Senator Ritchie, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much for the way you handled this nomination and the good work you're doing. Um, your professionalism uh, suggests you've been here a very long, long time, Senator. But uh, so you're doing extraordinarily well, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and Senator Alessi, pleasure to be with you, and we thank you for your service uh, and for expediting these nominations and getting these confirmations done. Uh, these are two extraordinary uh, gentlemen. They really are. Kenneth Adams, um, as you heard in, in verse during the nomination and confirmation proceedings. He's known all across the state. He's an economic development professional. He ran the Business Council. Uh, he has phenomenal knowledge and relations all through the business community. It is a key position for this administration. Um, I say to the Lieutenant Governor all the time, if at the end of the year when we add up our timesheets, if we haven't been spending 80 percent of our time on economic development, we haven't been doing our job. Best thing we can do is bring jobs to this state, generate revenue, jobs provide opportunity, uh, and ESDC really is the catalyst to make that happen. Um, I think, as the Senator commented, the best economic development tool we just completed, and that was the budget for the state of New York. 
where we pass that budget, which is a fiscally prudent budget, where we can now go out and say, take a second look at New York. New York is not what you thought it was. It's not the high tax capital. It's not the tax and spend capital. We are business friendly. We want your businesses here. We want you to grow your businesses here. We want you to relocate here. That is the great sales pitch that ESDC now has. And that this past budget provided that fact that we can now market all around this nation. Uh, the budget also had regional councils that will be set up, that will be funded, that will be energized, these regional councils. The wisdom is there is no one grand plan of economic development. It's region by region all across the state. And it is a bottom-up process. There is no dictation to a local community of what the economic future is. You come together, you do it on your own, and the state government as a facilitator and an empowerer of that local vision. I spent eight years in Washington doing economic development, did just this, and this method works. Uh, so I'm excited about that. We couldn't have a better man at the helm, and we couldn't have a, a more important agenda. And that's Ken Adams and ESDC, and let's give him a round of applause. Darrell Orbertine is a personal friend. Um, he is now going to be heading up agriculture and markets. The agricultural community and business is vitally, vitally important to this state. It is a $3 billion industry. You know, um, sometimes we get a tad parochial and we tend to see business vis-a-vis -vis New York City. Agricultural industry, this is a one of the leading industries in the nation, not just in New York agriculture. We're number two in apple production, number three in dairy production. It is a phenomenally large and important industry to um, the, the state of New York. Not only is it an important industry, it's an important way of life. It is the backbone of upstate New York. Uh, and you, you couldn't design a better person to lead the agency than Darrell, right? Uh, sixth-generation farmer, so he knows the industry, uh, and served in the New York State Assembly, serves in the New York State Senate. You couldn't concoct a better formula if you, if you tried. Uh, you put on top of that a personality that just works. A little quirky sense of humor once in a while, but basically a great personality. Uh, so he has the credentials, he has the experience, he knows government, he knows uh, the agricultural community. Uh, I'm so excited by his appointment and his confirmation. Ladies and gentlemen, Commissioner Darrell Arberton. If you now join me and we will make it official with a swearing in, we'll start with Mr. Adams. Uh, and his family, who's here today, if you join us up front. Diana. Oh, the Brooklyn Bar. <laughs> Special edition, the Brooklyn Bar. If you would raise your right hand, repeat after me. I state your name. I Kenneth Adams. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. Of the Office of Commissioner of the New York State Department of Economic Development. Of the Office of Commissioner of the, of the New, New York, York State Department of Economic Development. And President and CEO of the Empire State Development Corporation. And President and CEO of the Empire State Development Corporation. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Congratulations. Raise your right hand. 
repeat after me. I, Daryl Aubertine, I, Daryl Aubertine, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of New York, and the Constitution of the State of New York, and that I will faithfully discharge, and that I will faithfully discharge, the duties of the Office of Commissioner of New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. That I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of the New York State Department of Ag and Markets. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Kenneth Adams, why don't you say a few words? Thank you, Governor. And congratulations, Commissioner. We've, we've had an exciting couple of days together. <laughs> yes, we have. Good afternoon. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank Governor Cuomo for this incredible opportunity. It's an honor to serve as in his administration and to be a part of his job creation strategy for the state of New York. You know, the governor has put forth a bold vision that makes economic development and job creation our top priority. And governor, you and the lieutenant governor may be looking at your time cards and thinking 80%, I promise you 100% in my time card. This administration knows what it takes to keep private sector jobs in New York, keep them from leaving, and now, especially as the governor's pointed out with the enactment of this, of this new budget, uh, what to do to send a message to attract new investment into the state. He understands that the most direct way to improve the lives of citizens and build safe and prosperous communities is through economic development, through private sector job creation. You know, I'd also like to thank Senator Lisi, Senator Ritchie for their assistance, their support through the process yesterday and their leadership in the state Senate. And I look forward to working with both of you. I've worked, some of you have figured this out, some of my colleagues are here from the Business Council, uh, in economic development, especially as an advocate for the business community for something like 16 or 17 years. And Governor, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, I guess, turn my advocacy into action. Uh, and uh, I really look forward to working with you and with the Lieutenant Governor on the Regional Council initiative and on the other initiatives we will undertake to make New York State a, a competitive economy again at a national and global level and to tell employers from all across the United States that indeed New York is open for business once again. Thank you for this opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, Commissioner Darrell Aubertine. Thank you, Governor. It, it really is uh, a privilege, a pleasure uh, to be here with you, uh, with Lieutenant Governor Duffy, uh, now my colleague, uh, Ken Adams, uh, but also I, I want to recognize Senator Ritchie, uh, Senator Alisi for, uh, you know, helping through the process and, and making it go as smoothly as it did, and, and I really do appreciate that. But, you know, I, I really am. I, I could not be more optimistic uh, and, and more excited about the opportunities uh, that are before us as it relates to agriculture and as agriculture, uh, as the governor rightly pointed out, uh, relates to economic development. Uh, I think for far too long, uh, New York State ha has failed to recognize uh, the key role that agriculture can and will play now uh, that this administration, that this governor, ha has recognized and really has put into place uh, a real connection between my agency, the agency of, of Ag and Markets, and e economic development. Uh, that has not existed in the past. But, me, but now, because of your foresight, Governor, we will make progress, unlike before, in areas of the state that have suffered uh, and lagged behind uh, other areas of the state economically. So having this opportunity uh, for, me, for me uh, while it may be a g dream job, it's a dream opportunity for me uh, to be part of, of this team, a part of this administration, uh, to move 
uh, our agenda forward uh, is something that I am very, very much looking forward to. And I, I certainly look forward to working with you, Governor, and, and the entire team here in the administration, as well as the legislature. So, Governor, I thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. And please tell Senator uh, Scalos for us that we appreciate the expedition of these, uh, these confirmations. Questions, comments? Don't run away, guys. Just when the court, come back here. Ho, 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 ho. I'll show you how it works. This is how it works now. Ready? Your first day on the job? These people will ask questions. The easy questions I will answer. The tough questions I will defer to you. <laughs> questions, comments? Well, See, no questions. Okay, congratulations. Governor, on a topic other than the swearing in that you just said, I wonder if I could ask you what you would say to reports that you reached an agreement with Speaker Silver on a new ethics law. I would say, Mr. Dicker, that uh, we are having conversations with uh, the Senate and the Assembly on the ethics law, as you know, uh, a priority for me in this session will be getting ethics reform one way or the other. And we've had positive conversations with both the Assembly and the Senate. <clears throat> the conversations have proceeded further with the Assembly. They're ongoing with the Senate. Uh, but um, uh, as I've said before, this isn't a game of horseshoes. Getting close doesn't count. Either you pass a piece of legislation or you don't pass a piece of legislation. And this is an Albanyism where the assembly or is there not? No, there is no agreement until there's an agreement, a uh, final agreement, and there is no final agreement. We are having conversations and we are proceeding well, but there is no final agreement. Just to follow up, Governor, on that, as AG, um, you urge lawmakers to give you kind of wider powers in the jurisdiction to investigate public corruption. You know it's sort of limited currently in the law. Is that something you still support to widen the AG's powers to investigate corruption? That is a, uh, an issue I've supported for many, many years. I would support it now. It's different than the ethics legislation. It's not in the le ethics legislation. No, it's a different piece of legislation. I proposed a different piece of legislation. Governor, how important is it for you to see rent regulation strengthened and extended be way before the June 15th deadline, like say in April or May? Many Democrats in the Assembly are afraid to wait until the deadline to reach an agreement on that. Well, I think uh, let's separate the two things. It is extraordinarily important, in my opinion, that we not only continue, but that we extend the protections, uh, the affordable housing protections, rent stabilization protections. The second question becomes a question of timing. This law is in place until it expires in June. I think what they're saying is nobody wants to get right down to the deadline and have a clock ticking over our heads that says if you don't pass it by midnight tonight, uh, then a million families will lose their protection. So they want it done early enough so that we don't have the threat of the deadline and midnight and losing the legal protection. I think that's right. Uh, but I think the end is more important than the means. And the end is vitally important. Back on ethics, why do you think the speaker then says that he's in? Full, you guys are in full agreement on an ethics proposal, and then now it's trying to get the Senate on board. I think we have had uh, positive conversations and significant conversations, but we do not have a final agreement. But if the, if the Senate agreed to what you've been talking, do you feel though that you have reached an accord with the Assembly? In other words, if the Senate came on board with what you've been talking about, do you feel that you're at a point where there would be a deal? Yeah, in this business, Ken, it takes three to tango, right? Um, I have an agreement with the Assembly. If I don't have an agreement with the Senate, I don't have an agreement, right? I want a three. I want a bill to pass. To pass a bill, I need the Assembly and the Senate. So, you don't have to agree with the Assembly now, or do you? That would be your question. No, I have ongoing conversations with the Assembly and the Senate. We have had positive conversations with the Assembly. We are further down the road with the Assembly. But I want to get a bill passed, which means I need a three-way agreement. And you know how it works. When you have, I'll be having conversations with the Senate. The Senate will want to make changes. They'll have ideas. They'll have additions to the bill. 
and then we have to go back and uh, redo the whole thing. Governor, what is your priority now? You know the news business moves fast. Well, what is your priority now? To relish and bask in the glow of a past budget. That is my priority. I'm going to do that for about three weeks, I think. We have it scheduled that's blocked out. Bask in glow. That's the way we have three weeks. Seriously. I'm serious, Karen. I am very, very serious. Uh, a lawsuit brought on by some Senate Republicans over uh, the prison population of the county. Uh, it's a lawsuit that the state will defend. We have to work out who defends it. Uh, the Attorney General's office would normally defend this. Uh, an action like this. I know that in this case, the Attorney General was involved in the legislation himself, so we have to sort through those issues. Governor, property tax cap is a key reform for you. Keep many, many trying to get past, past the Senate. Now it's before the Assembly. What are you going to try to do to try to get it passed in the Assembly? Do you see that will there be room for negotiation in terms of exemptions or <clears throat> potentially not being a 2% cap? Joe, there's always room for negotiations. This is Albany. Um, property tax cap is very important, and it is a serious question to, uh, to Karen's previous question. The property tax cap is a priority. Ethics reform is a priority, one way or the other, on ethics reform. Uh, property tax cap and rent would be uh, three of the top priorities. Governor, you spoke to the Senate about redistricting and the concern. Very feisty. About, about, about the constitutionality. You should be basking in the glow. It's your glow too, Mike. We are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I can see you basking. Um, Governor, though, you spoke to the Senate about their concern about the constitutionality of a change in redistricting. And under what circumstances would you still veto redistricting lines? We are having ongoing redistricting conversations about redistricting. Um, I don't think it would be appropriate to comment beyond that at this time. Prepared to veto lines that are Say well, but what, what would they have to be for you to veto them? It's, I'd rather, we have ongoing conversations. I'd rather keep it at that for now. Governor, you responded to complaints about the last in, first out system for teachers by proposing a sped up uh, evaluation process. Uh, this week, the SED put out a report said that they are highly concerned about their ability to get that done even by next year, let alone this year. How do you respond to that? Well, here's my first point, Brendan. The, a lot of the conversation on education is about funding the business of education. When you just think about the debate we had on the budget, it was about funding the business and the business interests of education. I want to shift the focus to the performance of the education system. That's why in my budget I put forth two performance grants. Why? Stop the funding, stop the block grant, or a block, block grant, blank check approach to funding, and start incentivizing performance. And there's very little talk of performance in education. And there's very little talk about educational achievement. In all of this discussion with all of these groups and all of the noise, it's always about funding for the industry. I want to focus on performance for the student. That's going to start with a performance evaluation system. What schools are doing well? What teachers are doing well? What methods are working well? Are the schools in Buffalo working better than the schools in Syracuse working better than the schools in Suffolk? And what are they doing in Suffolk that they're, uh, uh, than they're not doing in Buffalo? Right now, you can't tell any of that. It's amazing, with all the money we've spent, you have very little performance data that actually speaks to the quality of the education process and how we're educating our children. So the immediate need of these schools to downsize or to right-size, in the word, in the face of this uh, budget cut, now using a, an objective evaluation system. If SED says one's not going to be done for 18 months or more. Well, then there's, there's two points, Brendan. First, we need a thorough statewide comparable performance system quickly. That's the system that SED put out regulations, which we are now reviewing, okay? Second, you have a second question, which is totally different. Well, in this budget, there were reductions to school districts. 
and they may have to lay off teachers. Now, that's a premise that you're assuming because you're responding to the, what I believe was propaganda during the budget debate. The facts are these. After the restorations, the final budget, only about 19% of the districts in the state got a cut, period. Of the 19% of the districts, the cut was, on average, 2% and change. When you add the state cut together with their local taxes, it was 1% and change. So some districts have had a cut of net average 1% and change. I don't believe any school district that is well managed is going to need to lay off teachers to deal with a 1% cut. Also, if you're looking at teachers, you're looking in the wrong place in this education system. When you look at the education system overall, past 15 years, enrollment of students has gone down 5%. Number of teachers has gone up 9%. And the number of supervisors has gone up 30%. How do you explain those numbers? Students come down, teachers go up 9%, supervisors go up 30%. So if you have to absorb a 1% reduction, and if you're in a period of recalibration and re-engineering and restructuring, shrink the bureaucracy and shrink the management and shrink the 30% of growth in the supervisors. That's what you should be looking at. But they have to deal with step increases and contractual pay increases. It's not, it's not administrative salaries, really. It's, most of the money is Kyle, I understand what you're saying. I'm saying if you have to streamline the system, let me take a step back. We're going to reduce the state government 10%. Okay? I have to deal with step increases. I have to deal with pensions. I have to deal with inflation. We're going to streamline the system 10%. When you have a 30% growth in management supervision, when the number of pupils have come, has come down and the number of teachers has only gone up 10%, I don't know how you justify 30% growth in supervisors. And I'm saying that's where I would look if you had to find deficiencies. When Walker has talked about having to lay off 4,600, maybe more teachers, is that just propaganda? Do you think any of those are necessary? Uh, we'll see what, what happens finally. Uh, I know there is a theory that says the city has reserve funds, as many school districts have reserve funds. By the way, Brenda, the name, numbers I gave you are after the reserve funds. Um, I'm advocating that the districts use their reserve funds now. Why? These are state-funded reserve funds. They were, quote-unquote, rainy day funds. News flash, it's raining. Double news flash, it's pouring. Use the rainy day funds now. You're going to get a 4% increase next year. You know that. It's in the budget. This was a two-year appropriation. So use the reserve funds now because you're going to get a 4% increase next year. And I would say the same thing to the city of New York. The mayor, the mayor continues to insist that they have no rainy day fund. That the figures that your administration is outdated, at least a month ago. And that's the disagreement. Your high-speed rail uh, seems to be coming along. Uh, with federal money. What's going to happen to the projects for the Tappan Zee Bridge and other transportation facilities in Bridgeport? Well, one, Betty, one thing is not, uh, they're not exclusive. And we're trying to, we're seeking high-speed rail money from Washington. We hope we get it. Uh, that wouldn't detract from a Tappan Zee project, et cetera. Uh, on large-scale infrastructure projects, finding capital uh, is a challenge, given the economic circumstances of the state, and it's one that we're working through. But one is not the enemy of the other. I understand that, but are you getting anywhere for funding for transportation projects like the Tappan Zee Bridge? We're working on it. Uh, I, have a quick I have a quick question for you. It's a rather benign uh, question. Is it a really a benign question? <laughs> Very benign, would you say? The other uh, questions that were asked. Yes, because these are fairly the problematic, these the questions, but yes. The but yours is benign. Then you can ask two if they're benign. <laughs> okay. 
Um, I wanted to ask you about, yesterday the state legislature passed a resolution uh, urging Congress to act on the Jewish chaplain memorial, Senator Schumer and Anthony Weiner are carrying the measure in Washington. Um, since all, you know, there are a lot of heavy hitters pushing to this Jewish chaplain memorial, do you have any thoughts on this? Or? That's not that benign a question. <laughs> the Jewish chaplain's memorial is supported by Congressman Weiner and Senator Schumer. Uh, I don't have any, uh, I don't really know about it, um, so I don't have any position. But it sounds like a good thing, and I'm sure if the Senator and the Congressman support it, I'm going to support it also. Have you begun asking the state agencies to help you with this issue? Because I think it's very important. How long could you defer those terminations and still achieve your, your savings goal uh, with only 9,800 layoffs? We're working through uh, a contract negotiation period with CSEA and PEF primarily. Um, we are hopeful that if those discussions go well, we wouldn't have to lay off anyone. Your, your point is right, Mike. If you have, if the discussions don't go well, Worst case scenario would be 9,800 layoffs. Um, we are not implementing any layoffs. There are several more weeks we have uh, on the calendar where we can have conversations before we come up to a drop dead point, if you will, where we would have to go forward or not. On the issue of the uh, property tax cap, um, you mentioned something about negotiations moving forward on that. Is there any concern, though, after Senator Scullo said today that you know negotiations could lead to a water down? cap, either a raise in the threshold or some exemptions. Um, do you agree that negotiations could ultimately go to a 3 or 4 percent cap as opposed to a 2 percent cap? Well, you know, you guys continually ask me to negotiate myself premature, negotiate against myself uh, prematurely. Um, you know my proposal on the cap, and I'm going to stick with my proposal on the cap. Do, do you negotiate these issues? Yes. And are there uh, different opinions on the cap, yes. And uh, have you, do you have new facts and circumstances on the cap? Yes. So I understand that there'll be a, uh, a brisk dialogue, and uh, I'm ready for it. But a cap itself is very important, because all a cap says is fiscal discipline. It is just the imposition of fiscal discipline on government entities that without it have demonstrated that they are uh, capable of excessive increases. And when uh, Ken Adams starts doing his job on economic development, I'll tell you what he's going to hear all across the state. He's going to hear homeowners say, I can't afford to stay in my home. I can't afford to stay in my home. The old question was, can you afford the mortgage? Now the question is, can you afford the property taxes? It is a major problem in this state. It tends to be more suburban and upstate, uh, and because it's not a New York City problem, it frankly hasn't gotten the attention that it deserves, but it is a major problem. So, the, the, Inspector General, the Inspector General uh, is coming out with a report, I guess, that says that uh, there's been a widespread misuse of uh, police official business placards throughout the state government. What's your reaction, and what kind of action might you be taking to address that? The Inspector General, police placards um, actually are a, an abuse that goes back 15, 20 years, I'll bet, when you look. Um, you, this, every nine months, there's a story on abuse of a police placard. It's one of those situations that the design of the system is prone to abuse. There are a number of specific cases uh, of alleged abuse of police placards. Police placards are issued to state employees, elected officials, um, to be used when they're on official business. And they're put in the windshield of the car, and the car is allowed to park in areas. They're also used to gain admission to uh, secure areas. Uh, a number of specific issues incidents were being investigated by the Inspector General. The Inspector General has reported that she believes the entire system is flawed and that unless you redesign the system, you will have these incidents of abuse recurring. 
Um, and uh, that does make sense to me, and uh, we're going to follow the recommendation of the Inspector General and reform the system. Uh, Governor, we'll be announcing that shortly. Got a question out of swearing in, if I could. So, Governor, when you were sworn in, I'm sure you were sworn in with an oath that ended, so help me God. Both these commissioners were sworn in with Bibles uh, being held out, and I didn't hear that phrase used, and maybe it's not something that's new, but I've never, uh, I can't recall it not being used before. Why wasn't it used? It's, uh, it's optional. You can they were add not it. Using it uh, we didn't have a conversation about whether or not they wanted to, uh, to use it. I mean, some might say you're taking God out of an oath, and that, that certainly for somebody who doesn't believe in God, that would be understandable, but that's like a policy decision that may have been made that I think is noteworthy if it has been. There was no policy decision. It's optional. Some people are uncomfortable saying, so help me God. Some people are not uh, uncomfortable saying, so help me God. I am not uncomfortable saying, so help me God, so I did. And we didn't have the conversation. Governor, on a very weighty matter, there's... So I hope you repeat yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> they are also comfortable saying, so help me God. <laughs> Governor, there's some talk of naming, uh, on a very weighty matter here, an official state national... These are all weighty matters yeah. today, Tom, I can this tell. One, this one is the, the most... The weightiest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sweet corn or the onion? Ah. Uh, <laughs> you have a take on this? A great question. Top of it today. And the, uh, what is the question where the answer is? It's like a game show. Those are the answers. What's the question? The official state vegetable. Official state vegetable. Is it a contest that, what would you, what would my thought be for an official, an official state vegetable? As I'm looking out at the LCA, that's a very tempting question. I want you to know, <laughs> but I will refrain. I do not have a candidate uh, yet in the race for <laughs> official state vegetable. Uh, I am, it's one of the first duties, however, I'm going to ask the new agriculture commissioner <laughs> to do the research, do the history, and find out what vegetable uh, we could get the most mileage out of here in the state of New York. Thanks, everybody. There's a proposal in the legislature that would allow school districts to put off some of their payments into their pension system for teachers. What's your position on that? Should they be allowed to, should, should, should their payments be spread out at, at, you know, allowing them to borrow essentially to put into the pension system? Your bill, we are looking at that now. Uh, there were comparable proposals for local governments, I believe. Uh, is this the controller's proposal? Chief nice that it's floated it. Talking about allowing the districts to borrow about a billion dollars to pay for pension contributions over two years. And then From the pension to... fund. Yeah. yeah, we're reviewing it now. We don't have a position at this time. Governor, not to get away any of the budget basking, but to what extent are you worried about the possibility of the federal government shutdown or division of the budget and said that a short-term shutdown wouldn't have much of an impact on the state's finances? At what point does it become a problem? Government shutdowns. It always comes back to shutdowns, doesn't it? Impending shutdowns. Uh, I was in the federal government during the last impending shutdown under the Bill Clinton, Newt Gingrich showdown shutdown. Um, from a state point of view, um, I don't know. I'm not going to uh, guess on whether or not it's going to, ha to happen. Um, some of the Democrats uh, suggest today that it is going to happen. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't have any information on that basis. If it did happen, I think it would be a minimal impact to the state, and we're preparing for it as we speak. Going back for a second to the, to the and vegetable. <laughs> How would that square with your own policy of not wanting to balance the budget requirement? It, it apparently wouldn't, Bill, but we're in the process of reviewing it. What's your opinion of uh, the, the proposal being a, a voice in Washington to? change Medicaid to a block grant program. Yeah, I'm against that. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, well, we are a, we are a uh, big Medicaid uh, reliant state, and we're redesigning Medicaid, as you know, and we're reducing, we've reduced the budget on Medicaid. Uh, but when they say block grant, I hear reduced funding, and any reduced funding in Medicaid would be devastating for the state of New York. Okay, thank you all very much. Congratulations to my colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.